Uh-oh, power grid just went down. Obviously not, the lights are still on. But what we do as far as preppers go and preparing for something like that is essential we prepare now because if it does happen via an EMP or a solar storm, the ramifications could last months, if not years, and will be nothing less than catastrophic. And stay through the video. Even though, spoiler alert, it's not gonna end well, we have to be prepared for this. First off, obviously, without electricity, well, no lights, no charging your phone, you know, which is communications, and right away, more importantly, no heat. Most people's furnace will not operate without electricity, so obviously having a wood stove would be beneficial. But even more so, you're gonna notice that your cell phone won't connect specifically. It says you actually have coverage, but if we're talking about a grid down, well, here's the thing. You make a call, it's gonna say all circuits are busy. With the grid down, there won't be any power going to the cell towers. Well, the cell towers do have backup batteries and our generators to keep them going, but why won't your phone connect? Well, the thing is it will connect. The problem is, is you don't have a priority line because if we're talking about a major catastrophe and the grid going down, then emergency calls like 911, for example, are gonna have priority, whereas you will not. Emergency management will take over. 911 has the emergency, so you trying to call your mom or whomever will not. And more so, you'll probably receive an emergency alert message over your phone. In fact, they'll actually go out pretty much over everybody's phone simultaneously. We've had this happen before, like in a grocery store, and it's a very eerie feeling or sound when you actually hear all across the store, everybody's phone doing that emergency alert broadcast tone at the same time. Now, telecommunication services have the ability to remain functioning for weeks, if not months, and this is the source the government uses to contact you for further instructions. So it is one of the highest priorities. So your first priority as a prepper, have a means in which you can keep your cell phone powered. And there's lots of ways. Uh, I'll put a link below for some of these things, but like for example, this Ocatel solar generator, it's great. I mean, it's small enough, it doesn't take a lot to charge it, but it's great for actually charging your cell phone in these situations. Or for a large scale situation, having a gas or propane generator can power your devices. On top of that, keep your fridge and freezer going, and in some cases, even power your entire house. Granted, depending on how long the grid will be down, you only have so much gas or propane. If we are talking about an EMP or solar storm, we can easily not have power to your home for over a year. Now you can go to your car and use it to charge your phone as well, but if it is something serious and we're gonna be out of power for over a year, you only have so much gas and every bit of gas you have is vital. So using your car to charge your phone, sure, it'll work, but it's kind of overkill. Using that huge gas engine, or at least just the battery for amount of time to charge your phone up, especially during a time when gas is gonna be scarce. Now, depending on where you live, the next 72 hours after the grid goes down, you'll also notice water will stop. Cities and towns have water towers. When the power is going, pumps continuously make sure those towers are topped off. And since the towers are way up high, when the town loses power, gravity will keep water pushing to your faucet. For an extended power outage, however, eventually the town or city will not be able to replenish the water to the tower and your faucet will no longer give you that vital sustenance. So the solution for this is obviously try to store and stockpile some water. Again, we're looking at a gallon per person per day. That's absolute bare minimum. So 30 day supply, your best bet, if you actually don't have other ways to get into water is possibly maybe one of those blue drums. There's one here on Amazon and a 55 gallon drum that will probably work for one person for a month. In addition, once the power goes out, try to fill up every extra container you might have. Jugs laying around, buckets, sinks, bathtubs, they're all excellent for water storage. Do it soon before it all runs out. Having a stream or river nearby with an adequate water filter is also a great option, but you need to understand something. You can't worry about only just water coming into your house, you also have to worry about water going out. Waste water. Sewage. If you're in a city or town, that waste water doesn't just magically disappear. Sewage treatment plants also have grid power to make them work. Granted, they do have backup generators as well, but in a long-term grid down situation, those systems will fail. As people flush their toilet, dump more water down the drain, that wastewater has to go somewhere, and it does. Excess wastewater will spill over into the surrounding aquifers, contaminating local areas like rivers and streams. And if you live near one of these, or worse yet, are downstream from a treatment plant, well, that stream water will be contaminated with dangerous feces, which is a good chance that's your situation. And that human feces, that contamination in that water, can be lethal. Simple water filters, like pitcher filters, will not filter this out, and you will get sick or even die. More advanced filters, like, like a Berkey, they remove almost all of it, I say almost all because some will pass through, but it's so small, it's probably not gonna make you sick. I actually use a filter system called a Katadyne. 
Here's a link for it as well. This filters out all pathogens and it can go tens of thousands of gallons before it's finally done and remove those pathogens that make you sick. Again, more than likely your local stream or river will be flooded with human feces from non-functioning sewage treatment plants. Now a week into the blackout, it begins to get real, not just real smelly, but real problematic. And most people will begin to have stress-related fatigue. Simply put, people are not ready for the scenario. And more than likely, most people at this point are running out of food. Not to mention, to make it worse, the only hygiene they have is maybe a few baby wipes or hand sanitizer rubbed across their body. And pretty much all grocery stores and gas stations and such will also be closed down. And it's not simply not for having power, but they actually depend on the internet to be able to do their transactions. And more and more stores are not accepting cash in these situations. So don't depend on going to the grocery store to buy groceries or the gas station to get gas. Even if you find a store that will sell their items via cash, which is pretty rare, the shelves are gonna be empty. Grocery stores work on what's called a just-in-time system where they get their food and just in time to sell it because we're looking at three or four days worth. The grocery stores know they don't want the food to go bad on their shelves because that's all lost for them. So literally they get the food in, three to four days, it's pretty much all going out. So think about this, three to four days, all that food's gonna be gone from the shelves. And it's funny, people blame preppers for hoarding when the emergency strikes. But think about this, it's not the preppers. As preppers, we already have our food. It's those who are not prepared who are flooding in the stores to buy everything quickly when there's an emergency because they were not prepared. In reality, it's the non-preppers that are causing this problem. They go to the store all at once and buy everything they get their hands on and give it three or four days, the stores will be empty. Now let's look at a store that will not accept cash payments and they just lock the doors. After about a week, people are running out of food. You know the massive crowds are gonna be storming in those stores, looting every single thing they have and let the chaos begin. So we're looking at after a week, here come the curfews. They will certainly be put in place. Not to mention overtaxed law enforcement will not be able to handle watching every single corner of the streets. Remember, there are no street lights on, everything's off. No glow security lights outside of businesses. Thieves will have their heyday and begin to run the streets. The cover of darkness will envelop all parts of the cities and there will be nothing left that can be done short of calling out the National Guard to help protect the people. But even they will be stretched thin. So your only solution at this point is you need to arm yourself. And not even just arm yourself, but look, this hasn't happened yet. Arm yourself now. Get the ammo, stock up in lots and lots and lots of ammo, and practice. Listen, people love practicing. I'm proficient at shooting as they shoot a little paper target 25 yards away. That's not gonna cut it. Because when this does happen, somebody breaks in your home to steal food, or even worse, tries to do something to your family, you wanna be able to protect yourself, that person is not gonna sit there and just pretend they're a paper target for let, for let, to let them you take care of business. But even worse, your heart's gonna be racing, your adrenaline's pumping, your hands are gonna be shaking, that target's gonna be moving, you may be moving as well. You need to practice all these tactical maneuvers ahead of time so you are far more proficient when the time comes. Have you trained for that? Understand ultimately at this point it is up to you to protect your family. Now, of course, setting a neighborhood watch in which all the families take turns watching out for infiltrators on a round-the-clock system will be the only means of keeping safe. And I have to add this. People say, oh, in those situations, I'll just bug out. Where to? The woods? You're not going to fare very well. And understand, if you go into somebody else's neighborhood, even though you are a respectable person, you have a family with you, those people in the neighborhood watch in that neighborhood are not going to accept you because now you're a stranger in their area. Think about that. So a month later... Now is when it gets difficult. And again, we're talking about possibly over a year until power returns. You need to dig in for the long haul. Think about this too. Power plants will not be getting fuel for their plants. Coal trains won't be getting coal. Gas pipelines require power to control the flow and pumps. Even the employees of the plants by this time will not be able to get to work. They don't have the gas. Not to mention traffic lights will be down. Out of fuel cars will be blocking the roadways. And I don't know if you know it, but it actually takes power to get a power plant back online as well. And if there's no power from other power plants, well, you can see this is going to be a very difficult situation. That's on top of repairing the problems that took place in the first place, which, again, even if the power plant comes online, it's going to be well over a year before it comes back to your house anyway. EMP solar storm will easily make this go out for over a year. Are you ready for that? Do you have enough food and water and everything to take care of you and your family for over a year? This is actually the bare minimum situation, what we're looking at. And this is actually painting a picture that's actually pretty nice compared to what's probably going to happen. Now, we also will go over videos. For example, this next video, FEMA and ready.gov tries to tell you what you need to do to stockpile on certain things to be ready. I'm going to go over this video as well. So click on this one next. But again, they're not looking at the 
the larger ramifications of this. You definitely need to take this very seriously and be ready for such a catastrophe.